Welcome to a live Pilates Hour. Today I have my special colleague and guest, Shelly Power. Hey, everybody. Good to have you here. Good to be here. And you'll also notice we have a really cool background and setup. The only thing I warn everybody about is that we are in the pathway of Ian. So if you've been watching the news and watching the the weather, Mm -hmm. we've got lots of loved ones in Florida. Uh, A lot of our family on Lizette's side lives in Tampa. So we're doing a little shout out to anybody that's in that pathway. We have uh, host sites and educators in uh, Jacksonville. So we've got lots of people that have been in the pathway of this really bad storm. And now we're in the pathway up here in North Carolina. So we're thinking that we're going to have good signal the whole time and we're going to make this work. But just in case everything blacks out. You know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> it is kind of windy outside. I, I thought for sure that since we left uh, South Florida, we wouldn't have to worry about this anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, it seems like we've had both times. Exactly. That, you know, exactly. Uh, well, anyway, we're yeah. happy to happy to be here and happy to be in the new the new recording studio. Yeah, that's our recording studio. We'll be doing uh, webinars and podcasts from here from now on. And uh, we wanted to get back together again. We had so much energy and so much discussion. Uh, two weeks ago, right. Shelly and I talking about spring tension and load and queuing that we thought we would do it again. And we also were not here last week, and that was because we celebrated our 30th anniversary as Polestar Pilates. So we had our licensees here in North Carolina from all around the world, as well as a lot of our senior educators, and had an amazing time. It was fantastic. It what, was great. What were some of the highlights for you uh, of the event? Because I had many, but I just there were so many cool things. Anything I, stick out? Well, just being able to get together and and several different educators came up to me and said, you know, we've we've you know been apart for so long, and I was kind of thinking, yeah, maybe I just don't want to do this anymore. I'm not as motivated. Uh, I just I don't know. Teaching on Zoom mm-hmm. is okay. And then I got together with everybody, and I am ready. And, and several different people said that to me in different ways of how just full they felt when they um, left on, on Friday, that we had gotten together, we got to work on our curriculum. And this was a really special group of educators that were there. So some of the licensee educators yeah. and education, educators from around the world to work on our curriculum. And I don't know if everybody understands that we do that periodically, and any any school, any institution should do that. Uh, we look at what we're doing, what's going well, what could go better, how can we, you know, move forward. And we had a fantastic time doing we had that. So much good feedback and so many good comments, and you know, people really thinking through the process of like, how do we continue to evolve our education process yeah. to best benefit our students? And it's the learning process that we that we became which is always beautiful to think of. We're studying the science of learning like we do with movement. We, we're going to talk today about the science of movement and learning movement, but we also want to be able to f- figure out what is the science of acquisition of this information. How can we make it easier for you and for future students to be able to learn movement science and apply it right. in a real-life setting? And they're, they're two completely different things. Like today, we're going to do a little bit of both. We're going to talk about movement science, particularly about muscle contraction, and then we're going to go into some practical applications of it, talking about how do you apply something like a concentric, eccentric contraction science into an actual movement without having to try to teach our clients what a concentric or eccentric contraction is. And I think, is. and I've, I've mentioned this several times, but in especially in my gyrotonic training with Angela Crowley, she would always tell us, she'd hold up the papers. We didn't have manuals. We had, we had papers at the time. And she'd hold them up and she'd say, okay, this is what we're looking at. This is what we're studying. Don't ever say any of this <laughs> to your client because it's not, it's not presented it. in a yeah. way that a client really should receive the information. So you learn all of this. And then through that process, you learn what to say back to your client or how to introduce something in a language that they will understand, which can be very different for different people. So I, just keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah. And again, you know, one of the reasons why we wanted to talk about this today is because in our process of teaching people not to teach by muscle contraction cueing, there are people that have misinterpreted that as being that we don't believe in muscles or we don't believe in muscle contraction. Right, or they're not working while we're and, doing things. Or that we're just somehow mysterically expecting bones to move through space without right. muscle contraction. Right, right. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, 
So I make this disclaimer that I do love neuromuscular science and am deeply rooted in it. And the more that I get deeply rooted in it and the more that I understand it over these last 30 years, what I realize more than anything is that, you know, our nervous system is so powerful of taking an image and communicating it. And what I realize is it does not communicate to a muscle like you have to contract uh, this muscle. It communicates to the whole system, the muscle skeletal system, all of the feedback mechanisms right. to be able to achieve the image we have or the task that we desire to perform. You know, the thing that it makes me think of, and we were just talking with this with Marie Searden, our licensee from New Zealand, how she brought Sharon Kolka to us. Right. And the story, I'll make it very short, but the story that Sharon talks about is imagine you're in your kitchen and you have your cutting board out and a very sharp knife and a lemon. And you take the knife and you cut the lemon on the cutting board and the juices start to run out onto the board and you can see the oil popping out of the skin. And if any of you are not salivating right now, I feel, I feel it in my mouth. <laughs> you don't have to, you know, the brain, it's so powerful in creating responses to things that aren't there. There are no lemons in this room, um, but just by thinking about it, it, it has a response. You have um, feelings or thoughts and things that go on. And if we can use these, and that's what's so powerful about the, the right image. It's not just pretend you're a flower. You have to get the right image for the right movement, for the right person, for it to be really and effective. Even, even with that image you use of the lemon, you know, it's the image of the lemon and your experience with the lemon that gives you that. Yes. I, I couldn't say, can you secrete your salivary glands right now? It, it just wouldn't <laughs> work, right? Um, I mean, maybe somebody can. And I, I remember growing up in elementary school, learning how to gleek. Right, right. But that's well, a different story. Let's not do that. But the idea is, you know, we are animals that process tasks and images, and most of our refining of movement is based on experience. Right. And so what we want to do today is I want to just a brief discussion of types of contraction. And as we go through that, please feel free to use the Q&A to be able to ask us questions about what we're talking about. And then I'm going to have Shelly uh, help me and go through a number of Pilates exercises to help us understand really the science of what's going on. So we're dissecting the exercise from a muscle skeletal and a neuromuscular standpoint to be able to understand it, even though we would never teach it that way. Right, exactly. Right? You have to understand it to then be able to use your own words and your own images that are going to be powerful for the client. And I think that's something that I've learned over the years is you know, as much as I understand the science of, I also realize that we don't teach from the science perspective. We teach from a functional perspective. Mm -hmm. And so that doesn't excuse us from needing the knowledge and the science of neuromuscular skeletal science, if that makes sense. So let's kick in and just talk about really three basic forms of contraction. And particularly in we're talking about muscle skeletal contraction because it has to do with the movement of the bones of these muscles. So if the muscle, they're all contractions of the muscles, meaning a couple uh, weeks ago I did a discussion with everybody here looking at neuromuscular science, looking at how the, the neuron comes down and the axon creates that neuromuscular junction and a message gets sent across, the muscle goes through a depolarization and ends up releasing calcium that causes the filaments to shorten and cause contraction. So all of these are the same exact physiological component of the muscle filament files, uh, fi filaments trying to shorten. So that's, that's the same in all of these. But what's happening now is in a concentric contraction, when we look at that, we're actually saying that the bicep muscle is shortening and causing the lever to move through space. So letting the arm up is a concentric contraction. The same muscle contraction process, but less fibers and less intensity allows that same lever to come down, and that is a eccentric contraction. So concentric basically is the same muscle we're talking about, is shortening and pulling the lever closer to the origin, or the we'd say the insertion closer to the origin. Eccentric contraction, same muscle fibers, same physiology, but it is allowing the bone to move away, right? The, the insertion to move away from the origin. 
So it's very important to understand. A lot of times people think, oh, if the leg is moving back, it must be hip extensors. Mm -hmm. And if the leg is moving forward, it must be hip flexors. Mm -hmm. But depending where gravity is and where the resistance or the load is, we've talked a lot about load, um, it might be the very same muscle that's controlling both directions as a concentric and eccentric contraction. Right. The third contraction that we want to talk about, same physiology of the muscle, is an isometric contraction. So if I take Shelly's arm and I fix it, but I tell her to bring or contract like she's bringing her hand up and I don't allow it to move, it's an isometric contraction. That means that the muscle is trying to shorten, but I am not letting the lever move. So it's an isometric, okay? So we've covered concentric, eccentric, isometric. Those are the three basic ones. Now, when we start looking at this, there's another element that we talk a lot about in neuromuscular science, and that's reciprocal inhibition. And so I want to talk a little bit about reflexes because this is going to make even more sense when Shelly starts talking about the demonstrating these exercises using neuromusculoskeletal science. So a reciprocal inhibition is a neurological messaging. So when we look at a reflex, right, a reflex, we refer to them as either a monosynaptic reflex. That means there's only one synapse. And what happens is there is a sensory fiber in the muscle. It goes to the spinal cord. It synapses with another nerve, which is a somatic nerve that's going back down to the muscle to cause a contraction. So that is called a monosynaptic. One synapse in the spinal cord it is a very fast reflex. I'll explain that a little bit more in detail. But typically accompanying a monosynaptic reflex is also a polysynaptic reflex. That just means multiple. And that reflex is going to cause an inhibition of the antagonist muscle. So there's a lot of words. A lot of you know these words already. But for the sake of this lecture, I want to make sure it's very clear right. what we're talking about. So an agonist muscle in our demonstration with Shelly, was the bicep. So the bicep is the muscle that is contracting. Whether it is concentric or eccentric, it is the muscle that's contracting. It is referred to as the agonist muscle. The antagonist muscle, then, would be the muscle directly opposite of the agonist. So if bicep is agonist, then tricep is antagonist. So reciprocal inhibition is going to cause an inhibition of the tricep when she's using her bicep. So as she contracts that bicep muscle, we're going to see a relaxation from the spinal cord, not even the brain, a relaxation impulse come to the tricep. And that's a very simplified explanation, but this happens throughout our whole body when we're moving. It's happening simultaneously. These reactions happen at the spinal cord typically or the lower brain stem to be able to control movement and react very quickly. Now, where I want to tie this into is we've talked about transverse abdominals. We have. <laughs> for, for, for decades. We have. We for have. decades. For people three are, decades. People are still talking about it. And we talked about how important it is. And one of the things from the research that came out that we often misunderstood is that the transverse abdominus came on 50 milliseconds prior to the contraction of the deltoid in Paul Hodges and Carolyn Richardson's research. This was right. back in 1996 and in healthy, in healthy spine. So what they did is they put a lot of EMG, electrical EMGs, into the abdominal wall in the back, and they asked the people to lift their arm up through space as fast as they could. And what they noticed was that the transverse abdominus in particular came on 50 milliseconds prior to the contraction, the concentric contraction of the deltoid that was going to lift the arm up. Now, that's a really important concept because 50 milliseconds tells us what? Where, where, did the, where was the reflex? It was fast. It was not... And where yeah. did it happen? Did it happen in the brain? No. Was it volitional? No. No, it's in the spinal, no, spinal cord, cord, right? So the thought process of, oh, I need to lift my arm up, there was an anticipatory response. Right. And it's not, oh, I need to contract my abdominals before I lift my arm up. It's already happened. Yeah. yeah. And that takes a thousand milliseconds. Mm. So you're looking at the difference between a volitional contraction of the abdominals is close to 900, 1000 milliseconds, where a spontaneous one is 50 milliseconds. 
That's the type of reflex we're looking at. So when we look at movement, if I bring a conscious contraction into a muscle as part of the strategy, it is going to be too slow and probably too much contraction to be able to be a smooth, functional movement. It doesn't make it bad. Right. It just makes it not as good. Right. And that, that's what we've been talking about is, you know, uh, we're not disrespecting the muscle contraction. We're saying, what's a better way? Right. And also you can you can think about I mean it sometimes we do and you as a physical therapist you're going to yep. you're going to work with people and you're going to have them imagine doing something and think about it and it is going to be slow but you need that in the process and what's important is you go beyond that to where they now have a strategy where it gets back to being automatic and yep. preparatory to movement yep. and that's that's really the thing that was kind of missing it instead of looking at Oh, the the uh, transversus and the multifidi, they're firing faster in healthy people and not so much in people with low back pain. And that's the thing we need to think about. It, people went and just went, oh, let's train the transverse abdominus yeah. because it's really important. And obviously it's weak in you because you have low back pain and making assumptions that weren't really right, what. Right. And, and what we discovered in that, because that was part of that was part of my dissertation 20 years ago, was looking and saying, well, is it really the voluntary contraction or is it the successful movement experience, right? So the successful movement experience without pain allowed the reflex to return. Right. And that's a very important concept for us when we're teaching movement and trusting that when we as Pilates teachers provide successful movement experience without pain to somebody who has had pain inhibition, which I'll explain in a second, another right. key word, right? right? Um, pain inhibition is what allows the normal nervous system through neuroplasticity and experience to re-educate itself into a normal reflexive response time to the anticipatory load. Right. And I mean, that's, I know it's a lot of words, but it's like saying the, the task was lift your arm up fast. So the brain knew what it meant to lift its arm up flat, fast in an adult. Adult knew what to do. Kids right. know what to do, right? By the time they're four years old, they know what to do. So they don't know that it's the deltoid muscle. They just know the task was to lift the arm up. And the body's anticipatory response that they learned also from early, early childhood. So we think this learning happens as early as one year old or earlier where they start trying to pick things up and they realize they don't have the stability right. to do it. Right. And the, the, the baby learns stability on its own through its task-oriented feedback. Right. And, and it's just the normal way. And, we, and I think also as adults... Um, certainly when I learn movement, and I still have these feelings today, if I had to go out and learn, I don't know, to, you know, relearn throwing a Frisbee or something, I don't want anybody to watch me and I want to do it perfectly from the first one. <laughs> I tell you that, and I happen. realize that, and I know it's not going to happen, but I still want that. And I think we're so either goal oriented of, I must complete this movement the right way, or I don't want to look silly in front of people. I don't want to go through the learning process, but that's how we learn to do everything. That's how babies learn to walk. It's how they learn to eventually find, you know, their mouth with their food and how you learn to ride a bicycle. And all of these things take practice that's not so good at first. And then you get better and you get better and you get better. And then you forget that you ever even went through until, that, that until, whole process. <laughs> until you have a neurovascular accident, right? Then you have a stroke, right. and all of a sudden, those automatic patterns have been erased or blocked. So that's when all of a sudden you see an adult again not being able to get right. their hand to the right place. They right. don't have the right proprioception. And that's where I wanted to go next. So that was a perfect yep. segue. Good. Was looking at the muscle spindle fiber it has a lot to do with proprioception of where we are with our muscles in our body. And the muscle spindle fiber is part of the muscle, uh, the muscle skeletal muscle. It sits inside the muscle. There's many of them. We often refer to them as intrafusal and extrafusal fibers, their name. And they have a sensory nerve. Now, typically, muscle skeletal muscle only has a somatic efferent nerve, a nerve that is going away from the central nervous system that is sending a message to the muscle to contract. So the majority of somatic nerves uh, that we have in the body are telling the muscles to contract. This, e, this afferent nerve, meaning it's going towards the central nervous system, in the muscle spindle fiber measures length and tension. 
So when the muscle's changing in that range of motion, it is accommodating what's called the alpha gamma coactivation. It, it is accommodating to the length of the muscle to make sure that the information coming to the spinal cord is accurate. You can imagine if there wasn't this coactivation and you shorten your muscle, the muscle spindle fiber would just be slack, mm -hmm. right? And there'd be no information coming in right, from it. Right. But because there's this eccentric and uh, not eccentric, but efferent and afferent communication to the, the spinal cord, it adjusts itself continually. And that does two things. One, it helps us adjust posture and awareness of where we are. And it also helps us adjust, adjust and manifest to load. And that load is often tied to our anticipatory response. Right. I knew you were going to. So, you know, I tell the story all the time where, you know, I um, was a bad kid when I was about 10 years old. And we took a quarter and we super glued it to the floor at the mall, foreign mall in Sacramento. Oh, dear. And we watched people walk by trying to pick it up. And, of course, they would break their fingernails, fall down, hurt their back, all kinds of horrible things that I feel really bad about. <laughs> And then about 10 years later, I'm working for UPS, uh, loading and unloading trucks. And I look in the back of the truck. I think I'm all done with this 40-foot trailer, all by myself, super proud. And I see a little tiny box in the middle of the trailer. And I'm thinking, you know, I, how did I miss that? And I run back to go get it, thinking it's like, you know, a pound, half a pound or something. And at uh, UPS at that time, we had a 70-pound weight limit of boxes and in, in containers. And I bend down really fast, and I picked that box up, and it turned out it was a 70-pound box of lead pellets. And I was anticipating a half a pound. Now, the irony of this is as soon as I grabbed that box and felt the uh, kind of thing, my anticipation was completely wrong, and I felt my back seize up almost immediately. The first image in my head was Florin Mall right. when I was 10 years old, thinking like karma, karma. you know what. <laughs> and karma came back and bit me in the butt right there or in the back. And I always think about that because I had no idea what anticipatory load meant back then, obviously, long before PT school. But this idea of anticipation is tied to experience. Right. So when people are participating in our Pilates training and we're teaching our clients, they've never done it before. There is no anticipation of what feet and straps feels like right. to a novice. They don't know. And so the anticipation is going to be a novice uh, strategy, right? Co-contraction. Right. So we're going to see an over-recruitment, co-contraction. Exactly. And this is where what I want Shelly to do now is to go into a little bit of explanation of how she as a master Pilates teacher uses this knowledge to be able to facilitate better quality movement and strategy in our clients. And to be able to go back and forth between what is the science of it, what is the actual teaching methodology that we're going to use to facilitate proper concentric, eccentric contraction, proper reciprocal inhibition, how are we going to facilitate proper anticipatory uh, response to it, how do we give them that time and that feedback so that they're able to have an optimal movement experience and not have to be a neuromuscular scientist at the same time. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I do, and it, do you want to stay with the feet and straps? Because that's sure, a pretty, sure. Let's, pretty, let's do that. Pretty and then we'll basic come back one. And we'll talk a few more science things and come back again. Great. So one of the things I, I want to do, and again, if you've worked with me, you've probably heard me talk about this, is I'm really particular with the words that I'm saying. Not so much so, you know, I'm super accurate, with, with the movement, but I want the client to have a good experience. I know that sounds, <laughs> of course you do, but it's not about me. It's about them. And so a lot of times I will take away the control of the movement altogether and move them through the arc of movement. It's easy. You stand at the foot of the reformer, you can sit on the bar and I just say, I'm, I'm just going to show you the movement go with me and kind of relax and the, the straps will hold your feet up. And I move them through, whether it's feet and straps on the, on the reformer or leg spring series on the trap table, could really be just about any movement. I give them the movement so that they understand even just the range of motion. So you're going to come up to about this high, down to about this low. Okay, now you start to do it, you keep going. And one of the things that I'll say is it'll wobble a little bit that's fine. Keep going. That's normal. 
because I want them to know from, I think this comes from my, again, my fear of not doing it perfectly the first time, that if something happens that wasn't happening while I was guiding the movement, that it's okay. Like yeah. that's normal. So you're going to take over control and you're going to keep going. And then I can start to give them more parameters. I'm not having them come up as high or as low as they can go. I just want them to move in the middle and start to understand that. Right. I'm also then thinking about the spring tension. And I don't really want there to be a lot of hip flexor activity in this motion yet. Maybe I, at some point I might. I'm probably not going to choose this exercise for it. I want the springs via the loops going on to the feet. I want the springs to be the hip flexors. So as the springs close and the carriage moves, the legs will come up. And then the hip extensors work a little bit to press down, but not too much because it's not a very heavy spring or a very light spring either. So there's a balance of the weight of the legs. I want them to learn that first. And I'm thinking ahead for something like leg circles. Leg circles are really challenging for people to do, not because they don't have the range of motion, but because we have told them pretty much exactly opposite of what they need to do. We have focused on stabilize. Don't move your body. Keep your pelvis glued to the Hold floor. Your Hold down. your back. Hold your abdominals. Really use your abdominals. You're, you're lying down. How much do your abdominals need to do? <laughs> they need to do something, but they don't need to do a lot. And so now if I give them a full range of motion, circles, frogs, all of the different things, they now can experience this in a really efficient way. I'm also careful about saying things like, don't let your legs go too low. And I, I wonder, like, what do people think will happen? If you've seen that YouTube video of the guy in the gym where he flips over, maybe people are thinking that. How horrible if you were really seriously working with somebody who was afraid of moving, maybe had pain with movement and associated those two things together, or just didn't move much, a bit sedentary, and you say, it, with all good intention, be careful, don't let your legs go too low. What does that feel like? I'm a, Now I don't want to move anything. And I'm probably going to move in the areas that I shouldn't be moving in. Over-recruit. And over-recruit, and it just is not, you know, it's not so good. So I can use this idea that Brent was talking about and brought in about reciprocal inhibition or just the normal, you know, concentric, eccentric, Eastern contract, you know, I can use that in this motion. So as somebody is pushing their legs down, they are starting to activate their hip extensors. Not a lot, just a little bit. And neurologically, I know a signal for the legs to come down, the hip flexors must lengthen. I'm just tapping into what's already there. If I just say straight down, sometimes that's not so great because people will let their legs go really low in their back arch. So I tend to couple that with the pressing away, but pressing down. And it gets people to the point where they can be just about hip neutral. If they came in standing up in hip neutral, I know they can get there. Or I can limit the range if I need to, if it was somebody maybe who had, um, you know, a stenosis or a couple of segments that were irritated and we didn't want to go too low until they learned really how to get to that range of motion. Basically, a, a spine extension precaution. So sure. A spine extension right. precaution. But you would be surprised how many people, and I've had Indeed. students, well, and I've had students, you know, shadowing me in classes, and I'll teach the healthy spine class or one of the classes where we have people with, have all kinds of different spinal pathologies. And I will say, press, <laughs> press your legs down low and you can see people, and there's just fear on their faces, not the people moving, but the students watching me, of, I know this person has stenosis. Why on earth are you having them get to that position? They have to, well, they don't have to, but it's good if they can in a controlled way with the right cueing. So as they're pressing away and down, they are more likely to be engaging the hip extensors a little bit, lengthening the hip flexors a little bit, and not having any movement change in their spine. That's huge because we've now given them this positive movement experience. They know they can do it. And they're doing it multiple times. And they're not having discomfort. And then right away, we can finish that exercise and I can have them stand up and they can start to understand how 
they can get into a more neutral position. Mm -hmm. They don't have to be here, which is more comfortable. So it's just kind of working with and taking some of these ideas into all the different into all the different positions. So that's that's one of the ways that I that I think about it. But you can use it anywhere. You know, it's 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 really you know how you just think about what's the active mover, where is the assistant. So my flick, hip flexors don't have to work concentrically at all. They are going to lengthen, and that's huge because that is one of the things that we tend to not use well or properly. Yeah. The hip flexor just kind of just stays short and it doesn't it doesn't really shorten more and it doesn't lengthen and it's almost like it gets out of kind of out of whack yeah, with we call it you actively know. insufficient. It just yeah. isn't doing its job anymore. Yeah, so. I really appreciate a couple of things that you mentioned in describing that. And one was, you know, when you, you described it as muscle groups mm -hmm. rather than an isolated muscle. So a lot of times People get so fixated on an isolated, like the iliacus, the psoas major fibers, or you know, it's like the piriformis, where really the body looks at it as groups. So yes, there's some um, isolation that happens in the brain, but really what you're looking at is hip flexors, hip extensors, sure. knee extensors, knee flexors. And, and I, t I tell the clients about that. Yeah. I want them to know this, this so is that where your hip if they're are. yeah, and if they're standing and. Maybe they're uncomfortable. Can they activate the hip extensors, right? Can they get their buttocks muscles to work a little bit just to give them a little bit more ease of standing up straight? Maybe they don't get all the way to neutral. None of these are, you know, it must be like this. But can you get into a better position than you are right now and one that has less discomfort? So I can now relate it also to their home exercises. And gosh, you've got to stand in line at the grocery store for a long time. Make sure you're not kind of sinking into this position. Here's what you could maybe do. You could just move your leg a little bit to the back and tighten the buttocks muscles a little bit and feel your thigh muscles working and see if that helps you stand a little bit more comfortably because I know the same thing is happening as well, long as they're not moving their, you know, the hip flexor, their torso. The hip flexor is such a culprit for so many pathologies now because of sitting, not because of the muscle itself. It's right. just... You know, we have, you know, sedentaryism. Of course, you've heard me get on my high horse about that. But the longer we sit, the shorter relatively our hip flexors are and the longer and more lax our hip extensors are. And what we're saying is, you know, when we try to stand up and walk around and do activities and we have that relationship between sort of a short and relatively actively insufficient hip flexor and we have a relatively lax hip extensor that's soft, that's why we see a lot of flabby, you know, soft tissue in the butt and the hamstrings could be if you're hanging on your ligaments. So that's a very common one going into what we call a, uh, you know, a, a slouch position or letting the, the back go into a um, posterior tilt and the pelvis in a posterior tilt. Uh, we saw this a lot in the dance world. So we'd look at our dancers and they're working so hard in their turnout that they went into posterior tilt in their pelvis and lumbar flexion. And what they basically did is took away all the motion and the strength load okay. of their hip joint, especially yeah. extension and abduction. Yep. So these are the kind of things that we're looking at is how do we deal with dynamic alignment? How do we set the springs appropriately to get the desired outcome? So there could be, for example, let me give you another scenario of feet and straps. Let's say that I have a client that really wants to be able to do leg circles um, in mat work, right? And they're having a hard time learning that the progression of the feet and strap exercises goes from heavier to lighter. So the idea is like, how do we teach them the movement like you eloquently explained, and then gradually start bringing them back so that they have less and less assistance, less and less load on the extensors, right. and more start now having more and more load of gravity on right. the flexors, and how do they, can they still maintain that fluidity and that efficiency that they learned with the assistance. And a lot of this work is what Joseph Pilates was thinking of is if you can't do my mat work, get on the reformer or trapeze table or the chair and let's let's give you an impression of a positive movement experience with the springs assisting that motion and then wean you back off of it because the idea of doing contrology every day wasn't going to a studio with equipment. Right. It was doing the mat, doing work. mat work. And so hip circles were a very important exercise for him and they should be for us. And so this is a great example of how we can play with the load 
variation or load manipulations we talked about two weeks ago. And if we understand that, oh, this person uh, maybe has some back pathology, let's, let's work a little bit, like you said, on getting that hip extension, right? And getting the reciprocal inhibition of the hip flexors that would allow them to stand up a little bit taller instead of always being in that flex position. And you have to think of things like, you know, disc pathology. So the posterior lateral disc, if it's always loaded in flexion when we're sitting and when we're standing and when we're lifting, it's going to have wear and tear on it that eventually could lead to degenerative changes faster. It could lead to some pathology that causes pain faster. And yet, if we just reverse that a little bit, I think this is where the beauty of Pilates is. And by the way, I'll reiterate again, if you didn't hear me a couple of weeks ago, the, uh, the British uh, Journal of Medicine. Right just came out and identified Pilates as one of the top three best rehabilitation interventions for mechanical low back pain. And I think we can explain why right here, very simply, we've been talking about it for 30 years. But as Shelley said, if we can create that inhibition of the hip flexors, almost always decreases the load on the spine. And we think that's one of the things that creates some of the best positive movement experiences for our client to shift their belief mm -hmm. or their paradigm. And that's just, a, you know, these are powerful tools. And I think we as Pilates teachers take it for granted. We teach a recipe of exercises. We go through them without giving a thought as to why did that series of exercises have such a great result on my client? You're getting the results because it's built in to Joe's right. work. Right. It's, it's easy to have a good result. The, the work itself is, you know, it's so powerful but then it also, you know, sometimes you don't have a good result and somebody doesn't have a great experience with it. So, again, if you know some of these pieces, you can you can start to question, hmm, okay, why did they have a good experience? Why did they not, you know, have such a great experience? How can I change things? How can I change the experience uh, so that they, it, it fits them? And I think that's a lot of, you know, it's, it's, well, we have to teach the exercise or we have to do it a certain way. And that's just not... It's just not how the body is. Again, yeah. I bring up, you know, if you're working with a 95-pound young dancer and you're working with a 300-pound football player, like American football player or rugby player, the book and you put, red and a blue if you put the same spring on for those two people, they're going to have vastly different experiences. And I can see you all at home going, yeah, duh, of course, we know this. But so many people nod and say, oh, sure, I understand this. And then they go back and they do the exact same thing in the studio. <laughs> um, so it's it's a little frustrating for me. <laughs> to, like, how do I shout it off, you know, over the loudspeaker so that everybody really hears it? But, you know, it's just it, it takes time. And that's and that's yeah. all right. Now, that's I want right. to shift gears just a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talked a little bit about the novice um, progression of an exercise. And if we have a little bit of forethought on what we're trying to achieve, I think this is where, you know, we have to be a couple steps ahead of what the desired outcome is for our client, and we need to plan it appropriately. So a novice client, we said that the response to movement in novelty is typically a co-contraction. So a co-contraction of a joint means, or a joint complex, means all the muscles around it are bracing it. So you can imagine putting somebody, let's stay with feet and straps, right? They're going to be using rotators, adductors, hip flexors, and hip extensors all at the same time because it's a new movement. They're not sure. So the range of motion is going to look very small, mm -hmm. right? And we have to think of how could I bias the load on the springs to be able to facilitate a change from the co-contraction to a more efficient contraction, right? Yeah. So in this situation with the way feet and straps are set up on the reformer, it makes sense maybe to put it a little heavier for a novice, as you mentioned, and give them a sense of direction of where we want it to load. Mm -hmm. And it could be either way. It doesn't matter. But the idea, is, I would say that's probably a little bit easier. But put a little more heavy spring, like a, a, another yellow spring than what you would normally do with their body weight, and give them that feedback into their body. They're going to feel a, an agonistic load. They're not going to understand it, right. but they're going to feel it. And that's why we always talk about, you know, get the exercise so the exercise communicates to them what muscle groups to use. And then that is going to teach them with repetition 
the idea of eccentric and concentric contraction. It's going to teach them also anticipatory load mm -hmm. that they can use. And these are the powerful things that now all of a sudden they get to where like, oh, I understand the exercises with two red springs now. Great. What happens? <laughs> what? Let No, I just say let's change it. <laughs> yeah, let's change it, right? So let's change it to, you know, a red and a blue. Right. Or... And, and there was a question. I can't see the whole question, but I, w I just want to add on to what you were saying. So what Brenda's saying is for this person with feet and straps is make the springs a little bit heavier. The thing you're going to need to do as a teacher is just to make sure both through what you say to them and where your hands are placed is that the straps don't pull their legs up a little bit too fast. It'll happen. It's okay. That also can be a teaching moment of, oh, wow, that, that really brought my legs up fast. Yeah, okay. Next time, just go a little bit slower. If it's somebody who I know has a, especially a spine flexion or a, a hip flexion precaution, then I'm going to have my hands where I'm not going to let them come up too fast. I'm going to, I'm going to slow that down. But what it does is it allows the legs to rest in the straps more. And that's where the body will relax a little bit. The body will be weighted into the mat. The hip flexors will quiet down a little bit. The quads will quiet down a little bit. And then the motion will start to be a little bit uh, a little bit smoother. So scroll scroll up just a little bit. Um, ah, my sister, Sinead, has a, uh, the comment. I didn't see who uh, put that in there um, about making the... Yeah, and her comment is right. So she's talking about increasing the, the springs on feet and straps, and then the client has a little bit of a struggle when they press away. And that you just kind of have to see, is it, is it struggle that's informative or is it struggle that is not informative and could be hurtful? Um, so if they press away and it's like, hmm, I don't know how to do that, Okay, well, just just keep going and reach out for the bar and just let them experience it. And that's where your hands can also just give them a little bit of assistance. And usually once they've done it a couple of times successfully, they'll start to understand how to do that. Um, but that's um, I hope I answered that uh, question. But it, it's true. They may have a little bit of struggle. And that's a great learning moment. The struggle is great is super because they are going to have to kind of reprogram the whole thing. It's like, all right, I'm trying it this way. Hmm. All right. That didn't work. What do I have to do? And that's where the learning, that's yeah. really where the learning yeah. happens. So. And you know, this is where, again, I don't, um, I, I want to keep emphasizing the idea that a co-contraction is natural and that the learning curve then becomes more efficient of the balance of the agonist antagonist in the direction of movement. Now, talking about direction of movement, I'd love to shift gears and go to maybe a little more complex exercise like reverse abdominals or something like that. Mm. that a lot of people sort of like, they go like, well, what's what's the agonist? What's the antagonist? What's what, what's concentrically contracting? What's eccentrically contracting? So let's go through another scenario. Let's okay. bring up another exercise and deal with reverse abdominal exercise on the reformer. Okay. So for those of you that might not know that or not know it by that name, this is a quadruped exercise on the reformer, hands out on the frame where the pulleys are, and the knees up against the shoulder rest, pulling the carriage forward and letting it go back. So that's reverse abdominals. And um, when I first learned reverse abdominals, I was told, here you go, do this motion, don't use your hip flexors. And at, you know, whatever, however old I was in 19, whatever, 80 something, I went, okay. And I tried my hardest not to use my hip flexors. And then I thought about it and I thought, wait, what? <laughs> it's like do a bicep curl without using your biceps. So clearly the hip flexor is the um, predominant remember. mover, right? So it is moving. It's the muscle that is moving the thigh, moving the leg, moving the carriage. And it's also the controller if we think about the return motion. So the hip flexor is going to concentrically contract to bring the carriage forward. The trunk muscles are active, but remember your abdominal muscles don't actually move your legs unless you're talking about muscles, and this is where I get into you know, the nitty gritty of this, is are you talking about muscles in the whole abdominal cavity? If you are, then yes, the hip flexors are part of, part of all of that. But if you're talking about the abdominal muscles, the four muscles, they don't move your leg. So... Also telling in the pyramidalis. Well, maybe <laughs> your tail, <laughs> but 
you know, think also, are you telling your clients to really use their abdominals when they're doing reverse abdominals? It's, it's counterintuitive because your most of your muscles, most of the abdominal muscles flex your spine. So rectus abdominis and the obliques all move and can move the spine into, into flexion. Transversus doesn't. And it is the one that is probably going to be more on in terms of just holding the body steady. But we forget also the contribution of the arm and not so much the shoulder blade. So there's a lot of talk about depressing the shoulder blade and bringing the shoulder blade down. But then we've still missed actually getting the arm to connect to the trunk. So if you were if you were gonna cue a muscle, you know, think about the latissimus, right? It goes from the from the humerus into the into the trunk. So that's your more isometric muscle. It's holding you there, and it's providing the stability through the trunk. And it's the trunk's not going to move now. That allows the hip extensors to lengthen. The hip, the hip flexors to shorten, and then the hip Constantly. flexors to lengthen as the carriage as the carriage returns. And hopefully, we're getting it deep in the abdomen, so we're not just getting the the um, quad as the hip flexor. So if you feel when somebody's doing it, you can't really feel it on your own <laughs> on your own body when you're doing it. Um, but if you feel when somebody's doing reverse abdominals, and there's a lot of tension, really superficial at the front of the pelvis, check to make sure that you've maybe not made the spring too heavy. Um, also sometimes too light because kind of what you were saying about the body responds to different Smart. stretches, to load, to pressure, you know, maybe there isn't enough information coming back in. So uh, that's, that's just one that I think is really interesting. And then I flip it around and I think, okay, let's do the quadruped exercise on the reformer that faces the other way. Some schools teach this, some don't. Some, you could also think of knee stretch with the hands on the bar and the knees on the carriage. But for us, we have the hands down on the frame. And I ask people if you had no springs on, and I do have many clients who can do <laughs> the quadruped exercise with no, no springs. springs. But if you had no springs on and you're doing the hip motion, the legs are going back and forth or the carriage is going back and forth, are you using your hip extensors or your hip flexors? And there's usually a, hmm. Well, hold on. Don't answer that question. Guys, okay. in your chat session, answer that question for sure. Oh, okay. Yeah, see. you can just put it in the chat. In the so chat. quadruped, the yep. So quadruped on the reformer, hands on the frame, Knees on the carriage, and if you're not familiar with that, you could think of the knee stretch exercise. Hands on the bar, knees on the carriage. No springs. When the carriage goes back and when the carriage comes forward, which muscle group is the most active? Hip extensors or hip flexors? Hmm. Hmm. Dum, 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 dum. And one dum, way dum. that I'll... Give a little bit of a hint. Should I give a hint? Yeah, you can give okay. a hint. I'm is, waiting to see all the answers come in. Well, I know. Maybe I won't give a hint yet. There we go. Some answers coming in. All right. I see a couple. And you can cheat by looking at others, but do you trust them? Yeah, and sometimes it's set to everybody, and sometimes your, your chat is set to uh, just panelists. So always check that out when you're putting things in there. So one of the things that I say, especially when we're learning this, extra, or I'm teaching it to a new group of students, is... Are you pushing the carriage back or are you pulling the carriage forward? Both are not going to happen at the same time with this spring setting. So do you push back with no springs? I hope not. <laughs> You're trying like crazy. It's the cat on the curtains, right? If we had the cat run in here and run up the curtains in the back and they're just holding on for dear life, right? You are, you are not pushing back because there's no springs. You don't have to push. The carriage will just naturally roll back on its own. So let's use, let's use the eccentric, concentric terminology. Okay. So to help me have control as the carriage is moving back, and my hip, my hip joint relatively is moving toward extension or in extension. My hip flexors, I don't know where I am on the camera. My hip flexors are eccentrically lengthening so that there is control and the carriage just doesn't go flying backwards. Once it's back there, there's no spring on to help move the carriage forward. 
Now my hip flexors are starting to work concentrically to bring the legs in, the carriage in to complete the motion. So the hip extensors really aren't working in that motion. The hip flexors are in both directions. It's like holding a heavy weight, right? I use the muscle to bring the weight in, right? If I'm using it to bring the carriage in and I'm controlling it so it doesn't drop by lengthening the hip flexor. And that gets confusing sometimes when you're thinking about the joint motion, right? Because my hip is moving into or toward extension. Maybe I can get there. Maybe I'm just in less flexion. So it's not always where the movement is, but what muscle group is either the prime mover of the, of the um, exercise or the prime controller of that, of that movement. So let's take it one step further. Same <gasps> exercise. Now we're going to do the same quadruped exercise, no springs, hands on the foot bar, right, or the, on, the, uh, yeah. on the plate. Yeah. And we're going to do shoulder flexion, mm. right? So now what... Uh, what kind of contraction is happening at the hips if we're just keeping them still? Are people writing it in the chat? Let's see. So let me repeat it. We're on. We're still doing the quadruped exercise. Our hands are on the, the foot of the reformer. Our knees are on the carriage. Now we want to shift the exercise to a shoulder flexion and extension exercise, keeping the hips at 90 degrees. Right, the, the hips are at a 90 degrees, a right angle. So now what is working and what type of contraction? I see it. Very good. Mm -hmm. So it is an isometric contraction, primarily of the flexors. And I'll tell you that you will feel like adductors and other things coming Absolutely. in. Absolutely. There's a co-contraction all far. the way around. And then, of course, we love to take it one step further and make it so that it is arms go into flexion hips go into extension all the way out and try to pull yourselves back in yep. with zero spring. So the primary movers in both of those instances for the upper extremities is going to be the extensor of the arm and it's going to be the flexor of the hips. Mm -hmm. And this is why we wanted to play with this a little bit because it is very complex when you're trying to teach a movement and understand the muscle physiology of it at the same time. And I think mm -hmm. we need, we have an obligation to know that as teachers. Sure. We need to know our muscle physiology our neuromuscular um, movement patterns, and at the same time, we wouldn't teach that way. So it's like, but understanding it makes right. it easy for us to figure out how much load and what are we actually loading to be able to create. Right, that. and I really like the idea of the isometric contraction, and I probably mentioned this last in the last one where we were talking about springs. Sometimes the springs are there not to be stretched out really fully, but to just push into them to get a little bit of leverage. And this is one, um, and somebody asked about cueing for, uh, cueing for short spine, and it made me think of overhead. And overhead is a great, uh, challenging, you know, no assistance short spine. So short spine, you're getting the assistance of the legs. I often think uh, of a Ferris wheel, of something that turns. So as my, as my legs are coming up this way, the carriage is rolling home and there's this big kind of circle. It's the same thing when you have the hands in the straps, but now if the springs are too light, the arms push all the way to the mat. There's no stability, that appropriate amount of stability through the upper body. And I don't have anywhere to move my spine to or from almost because I don't have the contraction there. So if you put the springs, I usually use a red and a blue, and I go into just the smallest bit of a push into the straps, into the springs, and I hold there. And then I do my rollover. That is a great place to start learning overhead because eventually you do want the arms to come down and hover above the mat. You don't get to push down into the mat. They should be hovering there. But once you understand it where your arms are kind of near 90 degrees, you can get the arms lower and you can do the rollover because you have the right stability around the shoulder girdle because that's the part where you're going to, this the part I'd say you're standing, right? You're going to stand at your yeah. shoulders and your spine is going to move. So it made, makes me think of that. The other one is something like thigh stretch. So when you teach thigh stretch the first time to somebody, really give them heavy springs. Let them push, not to push the bar down a lot or even on the reformer, is just to get a little bit of connection of arm to body 
And then you bend your knee and you, you know, you bend more and bend less. And it's, uh, again, you're getting an eccentric <laughs> lengthening of the quad um, if we're talking about that. And it's really helpful to, um, to, to think about it in that way, too. So we're not always trying to move the spring. We're not always trying to stretch it. Sometimes yeah. you want to just and, use it. And just an FYI, eccentric contractions typically are more challenging and also facilitate greater strengthening because you're taking the fiber count down to a minimum that allows it to lengthen which means the muscle fibers that are working are working harder in eccentric contractions than they are in concentric. So let's just summarize quickly today. Yep. Muscle physiology, we talked about concentric contractions, eccentric contraction, isometric contraction. We talked about the importance of anticipatory uh, responses, how our nervous system responds can, naturally. Can I add one thing to that mm -hmm. that might mm -hmm. also help it? Think about, we also have a reflex where you touch something either hot or sharp um, and you have this flexion reflex. So anytime you've reached to touch something and it's really hot or you step on a tack or something and that again, think how fast that is. And that's kind of the same thing that's happening in some of yeah. these other, it's it's a reflex that's happening before you can actually think about it. That might help and, a little and bit. And I have pulled up my notes here. Three it's the types of movement. So Shelly's talking about the first type of movement that is reflex. And so it used to be prior to the 19th century, um, scientists believed that all movement was reflex based. So everything we did was a programmed reflex. And then they realized that we had voluntary movement as well. Like if I want to bring something to my mouth to eat or I choose that I want to write or draw something, that that was not a reflex, mm -hmm. that was a voluntary movement. And then later we discovered that there's also what's called a rhythmic movement, these central pattern generators in our spine for things like walking, running, swimming, um, just different activities we do, even playing the piano and some of those things um, start getting as a reflex in an, sort of an autonomic or rhythmic mm. kind of response. So these are some really cool things we can talk about later. We're out of time today. But the idea of how high in the nervous system does the origin of this movement go? Mm. So the reflex is the most basic and the most primitive in, in the spinal cord or brainstem. And then as we go up into volitional movement, that's the most complex. That requires the cortex, uh, the motor cortex, sensory cortex, the frontal lobe, the coordination of the cerebellum, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as well as the spinal cord. So it involves the whole nervous system. And that's why it takes more time, but it's something that we learn and we practice voluntarily, like to play the piano or to be able to talk. You know, that's a, mm -hmm. something we learn. And the last one is anything that is highly repetitious that we do, like running and walking, are a combination of just a task. And very quickly, we don't have to do much more than think that I need to get from here to there. And our body at the spinal cord and the brainstem automatically are able to do that. And they've even done studies where they've taken cats and other animals and they spinalize them. So mm -hmm. they basically sever the spinal cord somewhere above the lower extremity neurons and they put them on a treadmill and the cats are still able to able walk, to walk. Yeah, on a treadmill. And so they try to apply that science. Now humans, it's a little more difficult because we have so much voluntary uh, control of our movement as humans. We've, we've, written so many written so many patterns on top of the primitive movement and right. reflexes that we have neuroplasticity that doesn't necessarily allow us to participate in some of those central pattern generators. Um, thank you, Shelly. That was you great. Bet. I you think bet. we make a good team. We do. We should work together. We should work together <laughs> as we uh, have worked together for 32 years. So um, exciting always to be back. We're excited for our new studio to record in. Uh, we love the sound equipment. We're thankful for those that help us with it. That's Melissa, Freda, and Stephen Farron that are now helping us with the uh, podcast. We're going to be recording these professionally, which we're doing, and putting them out there for better use and better access. And then just to give you a heads up, we have some wonderful continuing education coming up. Two of them happen to be here on the farm that we just had our 30-year anniversary celebrated the farm is in beautiful shape and a great experience mm. for them to come for two days. We have Open the Gate, which is really understanding walking and what we just were talking about. Yeah. Like, how do we facilitate rhythmic education and people who have pathologies that have changed the way they walk? 
How do we practice uh, proper movement to get new neuroplasticity to walk better? And the other one is working with patients that have systematic disease, things like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, um, even we're going to be talking about fibromyalgia and gout and osteoarthritis in a one-day rheumatology course. So both of those are available to everybody, anybody, uh, even clients that have those pathologies that want to come. It's yep. a great course for them to come to. We make it so that it's very accessible. It will be on the farm in the schoolhouse, uh, which is a very beautiful experience. I often tell people, if you're a little gun shy with getting back into live courses because of our pandemic history, uh, the farm is a beautiful place to break down that barrier because there's so much space, so much fresh air that uh, that we can overcome some of the phobias that we've all acquired yeah. of being in tight space exactly. and around too many So people. it's out in the country in, in Siler City. So a little bit west of Chapel Hill and all of that area, so you're probably familiar with Chapel Hill and Durham and Raleigh, and it's a little bit a little bit west of that out in the country. It's beautiful, lots of open space. So we'll see you next week. Uh, sending again out our love and our prayers to those that are in the path or have Ooh. been uh, influenced by Hurricane Ian. We also send our love out to those who are struggling with any aspect of their life, uh, whether it's induced with governments, whether it's disaster or personal health. We want you to know you're in our prayers and above all things, be kind.